Another former opposition leader, John Paul Langbrook, becomes the new education minister. Business and Indigenous leaders are meeting in Sydney this morning. The Australian Indigenous Minority Suppliers Council conference aims to improve trade links between Indigenous businesses and the broader community. In the past year, AAMSC suppliers have secured more than $18.5 million worth of contracts. Sky News business reporter Kai Chow is there and he joins us live now. Kai. Good morning, Bridie. And yes, we are here at the conference and I have with me Darren Savo and he's from Northern Haulage and Diesel Services. He's an Indigenous entrepreneur with a great story to tell. So Darren, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us, first of all, what is it that uh, you do? We uh, actually, our business, um, it, it, it's to provide solutions uh, for the mining and civil industry through uh, labour hire, hire, hiring of equipment. So that's virtually what we do. Um, and the end game for us is actually to provide uh, development and opportunities and training for our own people in the, in the northern area of, of Cape York. Okay, and what have been the challenges then of finding jobs for your people? Well, of course, uh, in our area, it's, it's uh, the opportunities to uh, actually gain contracts and work so that we can actually provide those opportunities. Uh, you know, it's always difficult when you're in business, but uh, it's definitely something that has been a challenge for us. And you had some doubters when you set up this business as well. Tell us about that. Yes, it's, uh, I suppose with any new Indigenous business, it's always been a challenge there. Uh, you know, one of the comments that came back to our business that we'd probably fail in three months and we were still there and in six months they also said that oh, well, they probably won't be here in six months. So, uh, you know, we're very pleased to know that uh, we've been going for three years and we're still going strong and hoping to improve in the future. So what is it that you've done that's been enabled you to defeat those doubters? I think it's taking our experiences and, our, and, and, and really providing, you know, our business with great workers you know you, it's, it's an asset that we have that uh, is sort of is, is really priceless so having people around us that actually you know sort of help us develop our, our goals um, that's really been a big factor in actually uh, breaking down those barriers so is it the culture of an organization would you say that's the most important thing to inspiring indigenous people or being able enabling them to take on employment? Oh definitely. You know the culture that we've been able to develop because we have indigenous people looking after indigenous people it's you know once again that's priceless as well. Uh, in that forum we, we see that uh, our people grow, they have the opportunity to grow and they don't feel uh, intimidated to grow and, and take up opportunities. Now you've got some fairly high profile clients as well. Uh, tell us about those and uh, what's ahead for this business? Well, at the moment we have several contracts with uh, Rio Tinto in Weeper and uh, you know we've, we're servicing those contracts well. We've been able to gain uh, you know several because of our people and the prospects are, are looking really well. You know we, we look to have solutions for them in the mining industry and, and as we move forward to, to also have those opportunities open through uh, gaining more work with them. Uh, there's uh, some big projects on the, on, coming up in the future and uh, we're looking to sort of check in on those if we can. Okay, now Darren, I want you to tell me about your cousin because he's got an interesting, he's an interesting success story here, isn't he? He is, yeah. We, um, uh, my cousin Brandon, he, he started off in the banana industry and uh, uh, a few years ago I said to him, it's got to be more to life than just working the bananas and he took up an opportunity to go out operating machinery, gave him some tips on how to get there. He did that, came to work for me as, a, as an operator. Uh, we sat him down and asked him, what is it that you actually want to do? And it was very interesting, he says, I love plants. So one of the contracts we have with Rio is, is a, a research and development program around the, the native flora. So just to better understand how it grows in those areas. And of course, Brandon was the perfect man for the job. He took this up and, um, you know, to give him credit, showed some great leadership qualities. And he's also uh, really developed himself to, to, to a point where one of the scientists that we, we engage in, in that uh, contract that really does rely on him a lot for, for the work that he does. Darren, thanks very much. Well, there you have it, Bridie. Uh, uh, Darren's story is just one of many uh, amazing success stories and many great businesses here at the conference. It just goes to show that with the right circumstances and right environment uh, that we uh, certainly can tackle the, the issues of Indigenous employment. But uh, we'll have more interviews coming up fairly soon. Uh, back to you for now, though.
Kai, thank you for that. And we'll be hoping to, to chat to Kai with another guest a little later in the program. Stay with us. We're taking a very quick break now after that. Retail Read, we're going to be speaking with Juliana Rowley from Comsec and get her take on what she thinks those retail sales numbers will show due out a little later this morning. It has a speedy processor to help her cruise through projects. But mostly it makes preparing playlists and keeping in touch with her friends a breeze. The Dell Inspiron family, powered by the second gen Intel Core i3 processor, starting from just $499, including delivery. Visit dell.com.au slash TV or call 133553. Conditions apply. Thanks for joining us on Trading Day. Let's just check on how the markets are looking very early in the session this Tuesday. And uh, as you can see there, uh, we're seeing gains. Uh, the market there up by about 0.2 of a percent, 4,338 points. Uh, we have been expecting perhaps uh, the markets be doing just a little better. But of course, there is a lot of caution in the markets given uh, we've got some pretty big uh, news coming later today. We've got retail trade due in about an hour's time. And then the RBA decision will be released at 2.30 uh, Eastern standard time and of course full coverage here. Let's have a look through the major sectors and materials again uh, one of the best performing sectors. Not the best performing though I should just let you know. It's up 0.6 of a percent as a whole the sector with BHP there uh, up about a half of a percent. Rio though outperforming up 1.2 percent. Energy stocks are a little mixed there. Woodside's weaker and oil search too off a cent. Gains though of about three quarters of a percent for Beach and just some news too coming through from on Origin Energy while we're on this sector. It's going to develop cleaner electricity for Sydney. It's saying uh, its subsidiary Cogent Energy is going to invest $100 million over a 10-year period to build tri-generation precincts in four zones in central Sydney, we're hearing. And looking at the banks there, we've got a flat read for Westpac at $21.72. ANZ's in the red, while CBA's pretty flat and NAB's doing well. Macquarie Group is off four cents there at $28.81. Gains elsewhere. Property stocks mostly in the red there, apart from Mervac and Dexas. And just checking on some of those consumer stocks. Woolies, steady read there at $25.64. West Farmers up a touch, up a couple of cents there at $29.93. And just keeping an eye on Metcash shares for you, they're still weaker. They're down about 3.7% at $4.14 after coming back on line after releasing that news that uh, had been awaited by the market of a, a restructure, job losses, uh, one-off uh, restructuring charge and also uh, an impairment charge on uh, its Queensland joint ventures. Now, it seems that the health of the retail sector is coming under fire on two fronts. On top of weak consumer spending, a survey by Dun & Bradstreet finds that store owners are increasingly concerned about the pressure staffing costs are placing on their business, so much so that those expenses are likely to be the biggest influence over their operations in the June quarter. 30% of retail executives said wages growth would have the biggest impact on profit in coming months. That's up more than 10 points from 19% in February. Staff numbers also facing scrutiny across sectors with plans new employment tip to be weaker. Well, of course, we've got those uh, retail trade numbers out uh, at uh, 11.30 Eastern Standard Time, so about an hour. Juliana Roadley, market analyst at Comsec, joins us now. What do you think, Juliana? What will we see? Look, we feel that over the last few months we've seen a little bit of improvement coming through in the retail sales numbers, but really a lot of the money in retail is not going into the stores. It's going into people buying services. So you're not seeing it in the retail sales numbers. People are still buying what they need, not what they want. They're not overspending. We know that debt's a bad word. So with all that playing into the fact that, you know, there is conservatism everywhere at the moment, uh, we're not expecting any great gains coming through in the retail sales numbers today. We're looking for a gain of around half a percent. I think we have to remember that the higher Australian dollar did very, uh, well, really helped the markets about a year ago. But still, you've got the Aussie holding above parity, making some solid gains, but it's not really creating, you know, the cheaper goods that we used to see here in Australia. We're all getting used to the discounts that we've had for around a year or so. So, you know, to get the real effect of cheaper imports, especially in electronic business, it, you know, most of that's been washed out of the markets. We know the discretionary 
ret retailers have been doing it tough because of the online spending uh, momentum that is still continuing to grow and many people just deciding to go offshore to do their spending rather than here at home. Now, of course, we've had Metcash out uh, before the market opened today uh, with its news and uh, really in there talking about the fact that uh, deflation is causing mm. it issues uh, and also, of course, that, that very cautious and, and value conscious consumer, as you mentioned. Yeah, look, you know, you've got major giants here in Australia and they've been controlling this uh, grocery market for some time. You've got the smaller players who are doing what they can, but Metcash, you know, they've come out, they've basically said, look, we have to restructure our whole business if we're basically going to survive, if we're going to go up against the big guns. It's not only at their storefront end, they're also going to be restructuring how many of their cash and carry outlets they have, looking at their business model and looking internally. They're also going to be cutting probably middle management. They haven't actually and where those cuts are going to go from from the corporation end but there is going to be massive turnarounds the, I suppose the news that came out most of the analysts in the market had expected that change like this would have to occur they don't really have an online space they don't really have um, a delivery space that has been working as tough as what they now have in at Woolies and Coles so they're going up against giants who have the power have the purchasing power as well as the delivery power to be able to get down the prices of goods to stores and the turnaround around time it's much better for these major uh, conglomerates that are out there in our in our grocery space as well so unfortunately they are working behind the giants they're trying to play catch up but it is going to be a tough task for them overall what do you think with what we're seeing on the markets at the moment we did see a lot of optimism surrounding that US manufacturing mm. data overnight it doesn't seem to be carrying through that much though on our market is it because we've got you know retail sales and of course the RBA do a little later Look, I think it is. And also, when you look at the numbers here at home, we're fighting a battle where we did really well last year. And now we're starting to see a lot of our economic data coming in below expectations or in line with expectations. Whereas if you look what's happening in the US, they're starting to gain momentum. There's a lot more joy out there. There's a lot more prospects for people to invest in their markets. They've got turnaround stories that are starting to come into play, even though it's very slow. We're working on the other, uh, on the other scenario where we were doing well and now we're just trying to keep up with the momentum that was there about a year ago so there's different mindsets being played out on our markets if you have a look at what's happening for our miners you know we do have the commodity prices moving higher supply and demand hasn't changed that much so there are you know positive signs there but everyone's worried about jumping on the horse too early especially when you don't know what's coming through over the next three and uh, the next three to six months because of the carbon tax the movements from the RBA and also the budget cuts which will come out in the next month or two is it a positive though that we're now seeing to hold above that 4300 point mark on the ASX 200? Look, it is, but when you look at our market compared to the other global markets, even the quarterly returns, you know, the average across the globe was up over 11%. Our market, the ASX 200, couldn't even get above 7%. When you've got the Dow, which hasn't really been getting that much great news, up by 8%, and the NASDAQ doing great guns as well. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of, uh, I suppose, confidence in the Australian market at the moment. We always seem to be lagging what's happening in the US and the Eurozone. The Eurozone had all those problems. They had the European debt crisis they've got growth problems they've got budget cuts everywhere and you know still they're making better returns on their stock markets than what we are so it really has a lot to do with confidence it's going to play into those retail sales numbers today it's also going to play into the data further on down the track towards uh, the next few weeks when we start to see what happens around the budget there's a lot of conservatism there we need to feel a bit more confident about our markets about the stocks that are listed on the exchange and get in there and start buying them Juliana, great to talk to you as always. Thanks so much for your insights. Thank you. The ASX is looking for more ways to cash in on the mining boom, with the company set to implement changes, making it easier for small resource companies to raise money. The Australian Financial Review is reporting the ASX is also considering extending trade for two hours to better cater for West Australian-based miners and cashed-up Asian investors. Releasing the major reform proposals yesterday, the ASX says in the face of unprecedented global competition, there's no room for complacency. Let's have a look at how shares are trading at the moment. Uh, off about 0.4 of a percent there, $32.73. 
Well, the second day of public hearings into misconduct at Sydney Star Casino get underway early today. The Yesterday, of course, we heard some sensational evidence implicating New South Wales Premier Barry O'Farrell in the push to bring down casino boss Sid Vicunta. Text messages suggested the Premier was ready to give Mr Vicunta what was termed a wake-up call. The inquiry is investigating the circumstances surrounding Mr Vicunta's sacking. Now, shares of uh, Echo, as you can see there, are just steady at the moment at $4.43, while Crown is trading higher. The rival casino operator, uh, it is up 2% at $8.73. Overall, market up about a third of a percent at the moment, 4,341 points. Stay with us. We're taking a very quick break here on Trading Day. After that, we will be checking in again with Sky News business reporter Kai Chow. Uh, he is at that AIMSC conference in Sydney. He is going to be chatting with City Australia CEO Stephen Roberts in just a moment. From a very young age, my father instilled into me that I can do anything that I want to do. Oh, some of the jobs, where do I start? Um, managing a couple of restaurants, breeding beef cattle, teaching igloo making. <laughs> now I'm actually a full-time share trader. I love share trading, it lights me up. It just gives me that total freedom to be anywhere at any time. As long as I've got an internet connection, I can work. There's no real trick to investing in the stock market. You need the tools to be able to make informed decisions and Comsec actually gives me the tools. I can trust them, I can rely on them. It actually gives me the freedom to live a proper life knowing that my business is actually in good hands. It's a great feeling. I think I've got 90% of my life uh, and experience is still ahead of me and that just thrills me. Retail revamp. Medcash to shed nearly 500 jobs in a restructure that will see parts of its business shut down and others sold off. Shares fall. Striking out, BHP says it can't make its coal shipments as workers walk off the job in the Bowen Basin. And waiting game, a majority of economists polled by Sky News Business believe the RBA will maintain its current benchmark rate of four and a quarter percent today. This is Trading Day. Thanks for joining us on Trading Day. Quick check on the markets for you. And uh, we're definitely getting helped along by some better than expected manufacturing data out of the US overnight that uh, pushed all those markets on Wall Street higher. In fact, the S&P 500 hitting a fresh four-year closing high. Uh, our market, though, uh, is benefiting our materials and, and most of our energy stocks doing well as a result of higher commodity prices on that manufacturing data. The overall benchmark, though, up a quarter of a percent 4,340 points. Some caution we're hearing because, of course, the RBA decision is due at 2.30. New Zealand share market today is pretty steady there. It's down about five points or about 0.1 of a percent. Now, around the region, we've got the Nikkei weaker there. It's down about a half of a percent there at the moment. And uh, we're also seeing the Cosby uh, going in the opposite direction, trading higher up about two thirds of a percent. Let's just have a look at some of those commodity prices and see how they're tracking at the moment. US crude giving back about a third of a percent now, that after a 2% gain overnight on supply issues and, and also, of course, that manufacturing data. And just checking on some of the metals, gold's pretty steady really there. Silver is weaker and copper at this stage, giving back about a quarter of a percent, that after it surged and had its biggest one day gain in six weeks overnight. A quick check on the Aussie dollar at the moment. It's at 104.2 US cents. Stronger too against the Kiwi, the Euro, the Pound, but weaker against the Yen there at 85.2 Yen. Well, let's return now to the Australian Indigenous Minority Suppliers Council Conference, which is being held in Sydney today. Sky News business reporter Kai Chow is there. Kai. Good morning, Bridie. We have many Indigenous enterprises here today at the, at the conference. And I also have with me at the moment Stephen Roberts, who is actually the, uh, the head of City in Australia. OK, so Stephen, what is an investment banker doing at this conference? Well, actually, Kai, I'm here with many hats on. 
uh, with my City Australia hat on, we are a supplier um, advocate of the Suppliers Council. We are a member of the, su the uh, su Supplier Council. Um, but I suppose my real hat uh, for the purpose of today and at other times is as chairman of the Australian Indigenous Minority Suppliers Council. OK, so tell us, uh, what has it taken to get this conference up and running? I mean, you know, how, did, how did we get to this point? Yeah, it's very exciting and it's a wonderful story. The concept of a suppliers council in Australia was actually born about four years ago through the vision of a few people including Michael McLeod and Duke Russell at Message Stick uh, with the realisation that true Indigenous economic prosperity is dependent on employment. It is not dependent on handouts. And so we got together to try and design and think of ways that we could stimulate Indigenous employment. And the suppliers council is all about introducing members some of which are the largest companies, many of which are the largest companies in Australia, with Indigenous suppliers. And what the Minority Supplier Council does is certify the suppliers to ensure that when they're talking about delivering and supplying large corporations with their services, that viability is there uh, and success therefore follows. And success speaks for itself. So in terms of the people that the Indigenous, uh, in terms of the businesses that the Indigenous businesses themselves engage with, is that viability one of the main concerns you were hearing before setting it up? No, it, the viability actually is surprisingly high. Um, and I can talk to one of the most startling statistics that we've discovered that the failure rate of small to medium enterprises in Australia in the first seven years is on average approaching 80%. For our certified Indigenous suppliers, that number is closer to 3%. So the viability of these enterprises is absolutely astounding. These are true entrepreneurs, um, and it's across such a broad range of activities, obviously in the mining sector, corporate affairs, public relations, printing. As you walk around these trade fairs, you'll see the diversity of enterprises. So so the viability is actually extraordinarily high. The challenge for us has been not to demonstrate as much the viability of the suppliers, but to help educate the large companies as to how to engage with these suppliers. And that is now working. This is the second conference we've had. It is far greater in magnitude. We have about 500 people passing through these corridors. And the actual number of contracts or volume of contracts that now have been written between suppliers and our members is approaching $40 million. I mean, what was the issue with people engaging with these Indigenous businesses? I mean, this of course looks like a, a business conference like any other. Absolutely, Kai. The, the, the main issue with engagement is just learning how to do it is educating the procurement officers within large corporations of the number of and diversity of suppliers out there and what they can actually do. And so what we've managed to do is to provide that broking or dating service to educate our members as to how to do it. And once they discover how to do it, it's, it's exciting to watch it unfold. And I'll give you an example putting my City Australia hat on again. Uh, we were approached several years ago by Michael McLeod at Message Stick, an Indigenous enterprise, to see if we could use their services with our telecommunications contract, which we did, and they've worked very, very well. And Message Stick has gone on to huge contracts with many of Australia's largest companies. But even at a smaller level, when we organise events at City, we will use an Indigenous caterer. We will use an Indigenous photographer. They're not big enterprises, but once you learn how to engage, they become big enterprises, and that's where it becomes exciting. So you mentioned catering there. So it's not just in mining and resource areas, then, is it, that we're seeing Indigenous Absolutely businesses? Not. We have businesses on the supply side for everything as you look around from public relations companies, printing companies, uh, energy companies, not just mining services. There's accounting, legal, um, employment consultancy. I, I cannot think of a sector with which we don't have some form of supplier representation. OK, now, you were the one that brought up uh, your status as, uh, uh, as the head of city. So tell us, uh, look, these troubled and uncertain markets we're seeing, they do seem to be turning around just a little bit. Is that what you're seeing too? Uh, look, I, I agree, Kai. I'm actually, I've changed my view. I am now a bull on markets. 
Uh, now that's albeit off a relatively low level, but we certainly have seen greater stability come into the market across a range of different areas. In the United States, we've started to see stability in housing prices and employment, um, and I am a great believer in the power of the US consumer, and when that starts to take hold, it's a very powerful global engine. The other interesting thing in the United States is that for the first time in 60 years, the United States has become a net petroleum exporter, which has fascinating implications for the global political, political environment. Um, in Europe, clearly there's bad news. There will continue to be bad news. But I think what we are seeing in Europe now is a um, concerted, coordinated effort through the ECB and the sovereigns over there to get things going again. It will take a long time, but at least I think we are going to start seeing some stability. Here in our Asian time zone, Clearly growth in China has slowed, um, but then when growth in China was 10 or 12 percent, we were all hoping it was going to slow. Um, so I think the outlook in China, while slower, uh, does not give me reason for concern. So I'm guardedly bullish, yes. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a bit of a cheeky one here. Uh, not too long ago, you said in an interview, since we are here at an employment type of conference, yeah. that you wouldn't be here, you, you wouldn't have a job if you weren't top three by now. How is that going? Uh, well, actually, it wasn't by now. I said I would be top three by 2013. So give me a little bit of hope. But if you look at our um, numbers in the first quarter, we finished number two in equity volumes, number one in M&A, uh, number one or two in equity capital markets. I don't like league tables. As an investment banker, we're very practiced at being able to determine what should be in league tables and what shouldn't. What I want to be is a top three player in this market, and we will be. Um, and what I said at the time was, if we can't get there, then I shouldn't have this job, and I stick to that. Okay. Well, Stephen, in any case, you're doing a fantastic job here. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. And back to you, Bridie. Thank you, Kai. So, Kai, they're speaking from the Australian Indigenous Minority Suppliers Council Conference. Now to company news. The BHP Mitsubishi Alliance has declared force majeure at its Bowen Basin operations, the world's largest supplier of seaborne coking coal, telling customers it can't meet their demands because of rolling strikes and heavy rain. 4,000 workers across half a dozen Queensland mines walked off the job last Tuesday. Analysts suggest the force majeure could impact the entire industry given the alliance satisfies around 18 per cent of the seaborne market. Unions engaged in the work stoppage will hold another meeting tonight. But this is the first time in over a decade actually that there's been such a close and been such a, a move made by a mining company. I think it's very, very significant. I think to some extent a lot of our attention has been on whether commodity prices would fall uh, and this was the worry, if you like, around some of the big uh, mining stocks. But there is actually more there are more immediate items on the, on the horizon. The, the chances are commodity prices are actually settling to some degree. The markets, particularly the Dow, is, is regaining strength and, and gaining some real momentum. So it's more like um, immediate issues on the horizon for miners are issues such as the, the government's relationship with China and the miners' relationships with unions. Shares of BHP today doing well. They're sitting up uh, actually about four cents or a point one of a percent. They've actually given back gains uh, quite quickly too. They did hit a high of $35.48, but they've now really paired that back to $35.17. Stay with us. Plenty more news about. We are just going to check on the lead that we had from Wall Street. All the details on that coming up in Street Sense in just a moment. Expertise is insight. Insight is opportunity. Opportunity is everywhere. Blake Dawson is Ashurst, Australia's new global law firm. It has a speedy processor to help her cruise through projects. But mostly it makes preparing playlists and keeping in touch with her friends a breeze. The Dell Inspiron family, powered by the second gen Intel Core i3 processor, starting from just 499, including delivery. Visit dell.com.au slash TV or call 133553. Conditions apply.
challenges and opportunities, the balancing act of Australia's relationship with China. We speak to Trade Minister Craig Emerson, fresh from his speech to the National Press Club. Plus, Assistant Shadow Treasurer Matthias Cormann. That's this week on Showdown. Hello and welcome to Street Sense, where we make sense of all of the moves on overseas markets. And it was a nice lead from the United States. Equity markets high, commodity markets higher. The Dow managed about a 0.4% rise. The S&P 500 index closer to double that, 0.8%. I caught up for a full wrap of the session with Alison Kosick at the New York Stock Exchange from CNN. Uh, as far as the markets go today, you know, stocks uh, here in the U.S., Brooke, began the week, uh, the month of April and the second quarter uh, with some solid gains. And you think about historically, uh, April is historically one of the strongest months uh, for stocks. Now, as far as today goes, uh, there was some mixed economic data out earlier in the trading day, a reading on U.S. manufacturing that ticked higher in March, but we saw construction.